So today I'm going to be working on finishing up the apron. Um, try to get this and the chains done. I should be able to get all of that done today. I actually, I, was, I forgot about the chains. I thought I was going to just knock this out and move on to some other stuff. But with the chains, uh, it is going to eat up the entire day. I'm going to go back in. I'm going to do a little bit more work in here as a darker value to connect some of these tassels. Um, I may even build up the highlights, depending on how much time we have. I may even go in and build up some of the highlights in here. They won't be overly time consuming because the basics are down. The general feel and placement of all the shapes is down. I'll just be building into them. So I'm going to start by just kind of working my way around. Um, I think I'm going to start down on this end, work my way across, then from the top down, and then do the outer, um, the outer band. So I've got my photographs taped up here. This is this, this comes out to here, and then I have another script for this. seems like a plan. Um, just got to get back into painting mode for this, kind of figure out what I was doing. It's funny, I came in today, I looked down at the brushes and they all look foreign to me. I have no idea what I did last week with this. Um, so I'm kind of piecing it together in my head. Yeah, you know, this is one of the things, like I say, I have no formula. I really have no formula. I just throw at the painting what seems right in the moment based on what I know and what experience tells me. Um, so I, I literally am coming back and looking at this and trying, like as if somebody else painted it and they described to me what they did. <laughs> and now I'm looking down at brushes, I'm looking at the canvas, trying to figure out how to best manage these things. Again, I don't want them getting any lighter than what I have in here. They are very, very bright, arguably, but I'm taking some artistic license to make sure that I maintain um, a value structure from top to bottom. Um, I am gonna be glazing over this at some point, so. Um, so, go back to the original brush I was working with. If I can find it. Wow, none of these are that brush. <clears throat> See, these are the moments, like, I'm actually fine. This is great. I know exactly what I'm doing. Um, I don't feel, I don't feel overly challenged by this, but I do feel like I just walked in on somebody else's party. It really does feel that way after being away for the weekend, um, or for what, four days. Um, and so for me, I don't like to leave things like this undone. I actually was planning on coming in on Thursday and doing it. And then I decided that nah, um, I'll just hold off till Monday. Um, <clears throat> but I hate the idea of leaving this done and this undone because you wind up kind of breaking your pattern. You break, you break that, that, that momentum that you have. And so, um, okay. Back at it now. My paint is still wet from the other day. It's skinned over, but I mixed enough of it knowing that it was gonna be used over a duration. I mixed enough of it to make sure that um, that I would, I'd be able to just break the skin off it and be able to use it today.
you mind turning the AC on? Sure. Thank you. So some of these things, I'm just hinting at them. Others, I'm going to be a little bit more particular. Like, we, like this, this star is so bright, and then I've got some lighter and darker areas in here. I'm just kind of hinting at some of them, trying to explain the outer boundaries, at least. I'm trying to let some of this show through, at least in as many places as I can. There are not going to be a lot of options. This is going to wind up very light like this. It's not going to be as dark as some of the, like the cuff. And I do want to move through this. I, I don't want to take too much time playing with it. There's a lot going on down in here. And so, and the, the marks are a bit heavier. So I'm not using that very fine brush. It's not needed. I'm actually intentionally making my marks thicker. And that's going to cover a little bit more of the darker shade. Make these things feel a little bit more dense, densely populated with this uh, whatever, whatever it actually is. I'm actually not even sure. Um, some of it is beadwork. Um, some of it is embroidery. It's actually many different things. It's not just one thing. So, I'm trying to make the marks a little bit bolder. careful not to overdo it. So I don't lean on the brush. I lean on the brush a little bit and it kind of opens up the bristles, giving me a thicker mark. But I have to be careful to not get carried away and start pushing a little bit too much. A little bit more pressure might feel like it'll do the job faster, but it, it really potentially winds up just making marks that are so thick and clumsy that they, they don't do the job. And so I do have to control that impulse to really just bear down on the brush to get through this. Right, and we kind of fight that impulse every place that we work. The impulse to, to just lean in a little bit. And, um, I'm going to be careful about establishing some of these things first. Uh, I'm just feeling like I'm, I'm missing some things. Back in here, I don't feel like I have enough space. And so, before I start getting too detailed, I want to try to define some of these things and make sure that everything is placed properly. Ones that are, are clearly defined, I can put in, but I am being thoughtful not to not to move into places where I don't have a clean drawing to work with.
Again, this paint is going down thin enough that it is, a, it is covering, but it's also allowing some of the darker shades to show through it a little bit. So this is, even though this and this are the same shade, this being a little bit thinner allows it to be a little darker than this because this is kind of tempering it. Again, even in here, I'm basically creating a decoration. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm mirroring, mirroring the patterns of movement, but I'm not matching it exactly. I, I know that this is a leaf of some kind, right? And so I'm just trying to get a pattern. And while we're looking at it here, it's gonna be a little bit lean. It's not gonna look just like this. But when you step back and you take in the painting as a whole, this little bit of stuff that is not so, so tightly rendered is not gonna be a big deal. And I'm gonna do that with a lot of this. I'm gonna open it up. Like, I'm not gonna make the flower quite this solid. I wanna to try to keep it a little bit more stylized. Again, from five feet away, it all compresses, and all of these marks become irrelevant. I could argue that if you stand out five or six feet, there's no reason for me to even paint this stuff. It disappears. However, when you get up close, there has to be something there. And so I'm putting this in as a decorative element for people who put their nose up against the canvas. But anyone viewing it from more than, more than five feet away won't even see these lines. They'll just see the elevated value and they'll know something is going on there. And so this is one of those places, again, where I'm making a decision about what moves the painting forward and what doesn't. Right, and, and that, that is the artist's job. And don't get me wrong, like I don't want to, you to misinterpret. I'm not cutting corners. I'm actually working harder by trying to figure out what needs to be here and what doesn't, right? The labor is easier for me to do less, but the thinking is a lot more. What works and what doesn't? What, is a, what, what does the job, but is not over the top? Again, if I start rendering this, everything has to be rendered and I don't want that. One, it's, there's a diminished return for the effort, right? You put all this detail and it forces your hand all over the painting to become like razor sharp. So a 60 hour painting turns into a 300 hour painting and the painting then feels frozen for it. It feels, because it's so sharp, everything feels frozen, it feels static. And so, you know, you're putting in all of those extra hours and you're winding up with this this painting that just, it just feels unnatural. And so I have to think through a lot more what it is that needs to go in in order to get the result that I'm looking for. I'm painting less, but I'm thinking more. And that's a better equation. Painting more, like it, this wouldn't be that hard to render. It's, it's only three values. It's a, a shadow, a light, and then some highlights. It wouldn't be hard to render. Um, but I just don't feel that rendering it would benefit the painting. I feel that it would actually detract from the painting. And so because of that, I've now got to calculate which things do I put in and which ones do I leave out. And trust me when I tell you, there's a challenge in that because if you leave out the wrong things or put in the wrong things, the painting doesn't move forward the way you want it to. Got some questions here. Yes. First one is from Becky. Yes. When it is, yeah. When it is framed, will the edges at the sides be hidden, like those details at the bottom? Will they be covered by the frame? The frame is only going to cover, maybe, to here. So I don't have to paint the very bottom of this, but it'd be kind of silly to leave it out. Um, 
I could drop this off. And the truth is I could probably paint maybe from, from here up like this and then kind of quickly just a couple of dashes or even just grade these lights down into here and let it drop off like this and create a bit of a, a fade as it hits the frame. And there's something to be said for doing that, right? Because if the frame is a hard edge here, right? Think about it. We're talking about edges, not just in the painting, but against the frame. If these are sharp edges bumping up against a sharp frame, they wind up on the same plane. If these edges are softened against the sharp edge of the frame, it feels recessed into the frame. Now, I've got enough going on here. I don't want to degrade these, but it would not actually hurt if I did. I could just put the tops of these in and then just kind of fade it down and it would be fine. But the frame doesn't take too much. It's, I think it's like 3 sixteenths of an inch as a standard frame. from Matt, your friend Matt. Yes. First tangent of the day. Regarding space and size, did you ever have to paint something so tall in your old apartment? If so, did you have to sit on the floor to do the bottom half? Uh, yeah, actually, in the old studio, I have a painting. It's a larger than life painting of Atlas. It's five feet, five feet wide by eight feet tall. And I painted that in, uh, in an apartment with an eight foot ceiling. So, um, the, half the painting, half the time the painting was being done on its side. So I was painting, the, the person was sideways while I was painting them, but there were parts of it that I was standing up on a, on a step ladder to paint the, the top of it when it was standing upright. Um, so yes, I have worked, and that's not the, that's not the only piece that's been on scale. I have a portrait that I did, um, a portrait that I did many years ago a family of one, two, three, four, a family of four life-size sitting on a couch. So that painting is like six feet wide by four and a half feet tall. It's a big painting. Um, but that painting just, I just did that, um, you know, in a landscape format. I didn't have to rotate that. And again, easel goes up and down so you can get it low to the ground to work up top, lift it up high to work at the bottom of it. And a question from Sana. How long would you wait for the oil to dry to varnish the painting? Um, this is not gonna take very long. So, so you've got a couple of things that go in there. We, for me, I use um, an alkyd medium. And so, and I work very thin. These are, these are, I mean, they're about as thin, these passes, they're about as thin as you can possibly get. Um, and because of that, they dry I mean, almost overnight, depending on the, depending on the color, obviously, the color has an effect on that. Um, so reds and, you know, like reds and yellows are going to take longer to dry. Earth tones are going to dry quicker. Um, but generally speaking, I can varnish the painting a week after I'm done. And uh, generally, that's what I'll do. I won't let this thing drag on and sit in my studio for eight months drying. You know, that's really, you know, when you start talking about that, that's really for paintings that have impostos in them. Impostos, for those of you who don't know, are, are just thicker areas of paint. Like, you can't put down a stroke with a palette knife and then varnish it a week later. You're talking six months to a year to varnish that. Because if you varnish it, the varnish is gonna dry overnight, and the paint underneath is still gonna be wet, and as it dries, it's going to slowly recede, and it's going to shatter the surface, the, the, the varnish on the surface. Uh, but this, this paint, there's nothing to it. It's so thin. I mean, you can see it. I mean, you can see through everything. And these are opaques. You can see through just about everything I'm putting down. And I'm just, like I said, I'm building this up over layers. So there is no layer here that's really heavy. The heaviest part of this painting is actually the face. Um, and even though that appeared to have gone down heavy, it really wasn't. The paint had quite a bit of medium in it, which, um, which again, helps it to dry. The medium that I use has, has an alkyd in it, and so it helps it to dry. Um, even if it's thick, it helps it to dry from the inside as well as the outside. 
Uh, it's a chemical reaction. So, so yeah, I kind of get to I kind of get to my varnishing very quickly. Sana said, "Awesome. Usually, you hear about months to a year of drying." Yeah, and again, depending on what you're using. If you're using alkyd, I mean, this stuff literally. Look, you can you can kind of test it. If you um, if you use medium and you you put down paint, right? Whether it's thick or thin, you put it down and it's like let's say that it's thin. If you go over it like the next day, say you take some alkyd and you kind of go with a brush and brush over it. Give it a minute and brush over it again and see if it lifts. If it lifts, it was still wet inside. Do that again on something over two days. You'll find at some point, two, three, four days out, it'll take almost like steel wool and, and, and turpentine to get the paint to kind of lift, right? And that means that the paint film's completely dry. It's not coming up, it's not breaking away. There's nothing underneath that's wet, so the skin that's on the surface kind of peels away at some point. And so this, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't varnish it the day that I finish it. I, I'll wait until I can rub this thing down and it goes nowhere. But I know, like, this stuff, it's all so thin. It's, um, so I don't have to worry about it. Again, when you start working in impostos, if and when you start working in impostos, then it becomes a very different story. But as long as you're, as long as you're working in thin passes, really not, um, really not too much of a problem. And again, if, you, if you're worried about it, you can actually just go in and use a um, retouch varnish instead of a final varnish, right? Um, so they sell, and that's what it's called, retouch varnish. And so you can put that actually on a wet painting. Um, in fact, I, from what I understand, if the varnish dries with the painting, that's not a bad thing. Again, obviously, your entire painting's not going to be wet unless you're doing the whole prima. So, you know, when it's something a little bit uneven there, areas that are dry, areas that are wet. But, um, I mean, the bottom line is that as long as the painting is not, as long as the painting is dry, um, or that you're working in thin passes and the painting is, is dry to the point where you can rub it, and it doesn't, doesn't break free or flake away or peel away, then you're good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, more traditional, like if you're doing, if you're doing um, like a more traditional approach, you would have to wait longer. If you're working, again, if you're working in impostos. Question. Yeah. So are you using a mixture of linseed oil and alkyd 50-50? Not 50-50. Um, my, my mixture is, it's about one part um, alkyd to five parts um, oil. And that just, <clears throat> again, it gives me enough time to work without the paint seizing up on me while I'm trying to paint. Um, and at the same time, well, generally speaking, dry overnight <clears throat> and again it also depends what colors you're, you're putting in you know they they try to equalize the drying times of paint they put cicatives in the paint and all this other stuff so that the palette generally dries in the same amount of time but a yellow is not going to dry at the same speed as a burnt umber burnt umber and earth tone is going to dry like it dry while you're painting where a yellow could take three days depending on how much medium is in it the less medium, the, the more time it's going to take to, to dry. And again, that's assuming you're using an outlet. There are mediums that are going to extend the drying time, right? So you've, you've got to know what you're working with. Where mediums are concerned, I don't recommend experimenting too much until you really know what you're doing, um, right? Because the medium affects the way the paint behaves, and if you use one medium, you get accustomed to all its kind of like idiosyncrasies, what it does, like 
like I know that my medium dries differently on humid days than on dry days. Um, and I've just been using it for so long that um, I know exactly what to expect from it pretty much across the board. Now, um, I've been, so I mix a huge batch of medium for the school. People come in, they work on Sunday, they're not back for a week. So it, I'll eyeball the mixture that I use in the school because they work for two and a half hours. So even if I'm, even if I have twice the amount of algae, it's still not gonna dry or get sticky on them in that time frame, but it'll definitely be dry the next week. And if I put in half of the amount of algae that it's supposed to be, it's gonna stay wet the whole time they paint and it'll be dry next week. Either way, it's wet while they work and it's dry when they come in the next week. And so I'm not so careful about my measurements when I mix the medium at the school. You know, there's a, and again, I say this again, I am, when I say I'm not precise, I'm probably more precise than most people. Um, I don't use a measuring cup, but I have, I have tools that I use for measuring. I do eyeball it, but when I'm mixing my own medium in my own studio, which I haven't really been doing recently, I'm very particular, very particular. And so, and yeah, I will, I'll use measuring cups because I want it to be exactly the same every single time I work. Because I want to know, like you've seen on this painting, I glazed in the background and the next day I came in, it was still sticky. It should have been dry. And that tells me that there's not enough alkyd in this oil. Now, the next day, the second day it was bone dry, but the first day when I came back, it wasn't. And it was the same with, uh, with the book when I glazed it. The book, again, it was red. It stayed wet for like three days. And all that is is that the medium that I'm using, that I wasn't careful when I mixed it to make sure that the proportions were correct. So, um, but I like to measure all of these things out when I do it for myself, because if I'm working day after day after day, I want to know that the medium, that I can depend on what the medium's gonna do to the paint. Also, if I do an extended painting session, I don't wanna be backed up against the paint seizing and drying up on me or getting sticky and gummy too soon. And so, you know, the, the medium, when you mix it, mix it right, you know, for yourself, and then um, get accustomed to it and what it does. Those little variations can really throw you for a loop. And so, especially when you're learning. For me, I can troubleshoot it as I go, but um, you wanna make sure that you, you work with one medium, get settled into it, and get accustomed to how it works in short and long-term painting and, and overnights and all that other stuff. That way you know what to expect. You know that if you glaze a certain color, you know, after some time, you'll know that your medium, if you glaze a certain color, don't expect to work on that area for two days. So you build it into your schedule. You don't come back the next day to work on a deadline and go, oh, it's still wet, I can't work. You know exactly, exactly what the drying time is gonna be, give or take a little bit, right? So you can plan your schedule accordingly. You can also seal the painting based on a schedule where you know everything that's gone down will be dry. Yeah, that's another thing. Um, going back to the, the question about varnishing the painting. If you seal the painting, that's a varnish. That's basically locking everything down that's underneath it, underneath a, a, a finished layer that's not gonna come back up. And so everything underneath it has to be dry in order to, for you to do that. So. All, like for this, this has been sealed actually a couple of times. Um, everything underneath that last pass of, of, of uh, isolating layer had to be dry. And when I went over it, if it wasn't dry, it would have lifted. So I know it's dry. And, but again, I mean, I knew that already because it's so thin. But if you're using isolating layers, the paint is going to be dry in order for you to be able to do an isolating layer. Frank said, thank you for posting the article on pricing your artwork to sell. That's always hard to figure out as we discussed last week. Yeah, you know what? I, I think like learning how to sell your work, pricing your work is one of the hardest things and it's, it shouldn't be. The problem with, with most people is that they, they pick an arbitrary number and it's not, it's not attached to anything in the real world other than their feelings. 
And um, yeah, that just doesn't fly in the real world, right? And so we want to be able to, we want to be able to, um, you know, when we give somebody a price, we need to be able to look them in the eye. Like, how do you justify that number? And if we say, oh, it's, uh, it's two grand, and then they push for 1500 and you know the number you gave them is arbitrary, what holds your ground? Like, what helps you to hold your ground? But if you know that $2,000 that for you to produce that painting, you're getting minimum wage, or you're getting $12 an hour, somebody says 1500 instead of two grand, you're like, if you're taking 12 an hour for that, you're not going down to eight. And so it's like, absolutely not. And you can look them in the face because you know you're giving the work away at a steal, right? At least when you're starting, that's what you want to do. You want to be able to argue for that price and and for anybody understanding how the price was arrived at, we'd be like, oh, well, that makes all the sense in the world. Sure, I'll write that check, right? And so if it's an arbitrary price, what is it attached to? I like this painting. I like the way this one looks. It's like people will do that with their art, where they'll have five paintings of the same size, and one of them is twice the price of the others because they really like the way that one looks, and they think that one's going to be easier to sell. It's not how you do it. It's not arbitrary. It has to be attached to something that makes sense. But again, what that does, by, not ha by having an arbitrary price, it takes art and it treats it like it's not a commodity in a capitalist market. And, but that's exactly what it is. Like whether you like that or not, that's the reality. And so you have to treat it like you would treat anything else. Imagine you go into a store and you, you're buying a hammer and the red hammer is twice the price of the blue hammer because they think people like red hammers, right? And it's like, well, like, how do you justify that? And it's the same thing with paintings. But I like the hourly wage as a way of going. There are other ways of assessing it. Like people will make, I, I've heard all these, all these um, ways of calculating the value of your painting, but like um, things like square inches. And, but it's like, well, you know, if I talk about, like in my painting, if I measure these square inches, And these square inches, they're completely different. Like if I have a $1 a square inch price, I'm getting robbed here. And I'm stealing from the person when I do the jacket. Now you can say it balances out, but what if the whole painting is like this? Or what if the whole painting is like that? It's not, it's not, re it's not reasonable. It's not reasonable for those to be the same price. So to me, the amount of time is the best way to do it. It's, it's really how everybody gets paid. So why not artists? Why, not, why should we not think the same way? And again, what happens is as time goes by, you, you establish a price based on an hourly wage. When your schedule fills, you move the price up. You move the price up, you keep doing that until the number of people, because like, you know, when you take, you take your price, let's say you're doing $10 an hour, and again, I'm just, these are just random numbers, $10 an hour, your schedule fills up and you just, you, you, I mean, people are like, you know, falling out of the sky wanting them at that price. You bump your work up and you give yourself a 100% raise up to $20 an hour. Now, nobody gets a 100% raise, but there's, now you're at $20 an hour and a $100 painting becomes a $200 painting. Now, you might lose, 20% of your customers in that, the, the extra $100 wipes out 20 or 25 or 30%. But just, you're now making more money doing less work. So instead of 10 paintings at $1,000, you're doing seven paintings making 1,400. And once your schedule fills up there, you then bump it up. So instead of 20, you bring it up to 25. Or even 30, you give yourself a 50% raise. Again, now you're 30 an hour and you only get five paintings. Right? Let's say they drop down. You're only finding five clients instead of the seven. But five clients at 30, it's a, you're only doing five paintings, making 1,500. So you lost 200 in the translation, but you also let two paintings go, which means your time comes back. And then, you know, so, so but you find, that, you find that happy balance. 30 might be too much. Maybe you need the 1,700 as an income so maybe the happy medium between the two, between the 20 and the 30 is 25. 
you may get the same five people at 25, or you may get the same seven people at 25. And so that's really kind of your sweet spot until you establish yourself and you start building out. Now you got 12, 15 people coming to you each year. Then you can elevate your price again to dial back on the number of jobs you do while maintaining the same income. But the thing is that that's all, that's all built into a, you know, a system that we all recognize works, right? It's supply and demand. And so, uh, you know, I, in here, in a school, when I talk to students about how to, how to be a successful artist, how to build a career, I tell them you have to understand economics. You have to understand economics, how these things work. Because if you understand how it works, you can see how art fits into it. Like you should take more classes in marketing. Again, general marketing, not specific, just something very general so you understand how to market. And I'll show you just two examples of how those two things matter. Years ago, I heard a, I, um, so the Yellow Pages, for those of you who are too young or don't live in the US, they used to have a book like three inches thick for your area in, in wherever, like in New Jersey, um, they would have like three counties and it would have all of the phone numbers of every person and every business that was listed. And it would just be pages and pages and pages of businesses and like they'll have like personal phone numbers, um, government phone numbers, and then business phone numbers. And it's all in one book. And that way, like because you couldn't just look it up back then, there was no internet, right? Um, so this was the only way that, that people could find if they were looking for it's an exterminator for rodents, they could look it up and they could find it and there'd be 37 options within 10 miles of where they live and they could call each one until they find the person they want, right? And so the yellow pages, I guess, was being, you can imagine every single year, the company that was doing that was probably doing really well, right? They sold advertising, so if you were in there and you were a business, you could have an image. Um, and so you pay for that service. And one company was basically doing all of it. I think they were doing it, like, I mean, maybe all around the country. And some company came along and figured out how to take all their business away. And what they did is they created a duplicate Yellow Pages that was maybe one and a half inches smaller in each direction. And that sounds like, well, why would that change? Like, why would they be able to steal business from the company that's been doing it for all that time? And so the marketing genius in this, do you know about this, Daniel? No. You should know this. The marketing genius in it is that when we stack books, we stack them biggest to smallest. So you have two versions of the yellow pages. One is smaller, so it's sitting on top. So you pick up that one. So basically the company scaled down the dimensions of the book so it would sit on top of the version that everyone was used to using. So people didn't dig out the bigger one from underneath. The same information was in it. They took the one from on top. And eventually the bigger book fell away because People weren't using it anymore. They used the smaller version, right? So just a little bit, and it's, again, it's just creative marketing. They created a book that was smaller knowing that books get stacked biggest to smallest. And so, again, it didn't overtake the original Yellow Pages overnight, but it was a brilliant marketing scheme. And all they had to do was go into these companies and say, look, this book's gonna be sitting on top of that other one. Everybody, it makes sense when you hear it. So. It was a, it's a floppy book, so you wouldn't stand it on a shelf like this. You stood it up, it would turn into like, like melted ice cream. So anyway, so that's, that's understanding marketing, just having an idea about how marketing works so you can be creative and how you market what you do. Now I'm gonna tell you a story about a painting uh, uh, and understanding of economics and just how powerful it can be. So years ago, I had a bunch of big paintings that I had done, figurative work, and a gentleman from Germany reached out to me about purchasing one of these paintings. It was a six foot by four foot painting that I'd done, and we couldn't come to an agreement on the price. I wanted a set number, he was only willing to go so far, and basically so the conversation ended with, you know, if you, you know, from my end, if you're willing to come up, uh, you know, you can have the painting, and from his end, if you're willing to come down, I'll buy the painting. And we just kind of went our separate ways. So. Maybe about a year, year and a half later, 
I'm watching, I'm watching the news, or I'm reading, I'm reading the news somewhere, and I'm looking at how the euro is making a run on the dollar. I mean, it's absolutely crushing it. It was like at the high point of the euro and, you know, the split between the euro and the dollar. And a light bulb went off. So I went and I did the calculation. And because of the difference between the euro and the dollar, he could purchase the painting at the same price that he wanted. And I'd actually be making more dollars than I was asking for. <laughs> Just because of the translation between the euro and the dollar. Mm. So what I did is I reached out to him via email and I said, hey, I was just looking at the calculation on this and if you're happy to split the difference, you can actually get the paintings at less than you wanted. And I'll, you know, basically, basically I'll, get, I'll get a little bit more than I wanted and you'll, get a little, you'll pay a little bit less than you wanted. We both make out great. He came back, he bought that painting and a second one because it was on sale now. And, um, and so and they were, they were well-priced paintings. Um, and they'd just been sitting up on my wall for, I mean, wow, probably three or four years. The guy came across my work on the internet and reached out to me from Germany. But the thing is, if I didn't understand how, if I didn't understand the exchange rates, when I, when I read or saw that thing on, on what the euro was doing against the dollar, I would, have had, I would have had no idea to even look at it. And so, again, understanding economics matters. It makes a difference. Again, if you have clients in, in another country and their currency booms compared to the dollar, basically you get, you're making the same number of dollars, but it's a fire sale for them if they're buying from you. And it's understanding that. Also, that if the dollar is having a really, really great time, the likelihood of you selling into a country where the, where the dollar is crushing their... Um, their um, their money, you're not likely going to be making sales, right? And so understanding that stuff, especially now that we're dealing in a global market, like you can have clients anywhere in the world. But if you understand that, when you see when you see a currency really kind of making a run on, on your currency, on their currency doing that to yours, if you know people there that are interested in your work, again, you can actually make more than you want to for your work while they're while they're actually paying less than they want. If the, if the discrepancy is broad enough. So, but again, and that's just one aspect. It's just one aspect of, of understanding economics to be able to use it to your advantage. Everyone is wondering where that article... Oh. Everyone is wondering where, where that article you posted came from or like how to, how to access it. Um, I have no idea. I didn't... Evolve posted it. <laughs> I don't know. Um, Dan, why don't you reach out to Mitch and see if you can get a link for them. Okay. Okay, so Daniel's going to check with Mitch and see if we can get a link. You know, I don't know that there's much there other than what I what I described as far as like figuring out the value of your work. Um, but I mean, the the real gist of it is just that you can't just pick some arbitrary number as the value of your work. There has to be some some rationale behind it, and that's one because that's the market we live in. Um, but two. You want to feel justified in the number you're asking. If it's arbitrary, it's too easy to step off of that number in order to make your sale. And I know people, you know, one of the one of the dangers of that is that, you know, you start and you're like, like again, it's two thousand dollars for the painting, which is a twelve dollar, um, twelve dollar an hour paycheck. Okay, and again, just these are just these are arbitrary numbers. It could be $100 an hour. But it's let's say so $12 an hour to $2000 painting. Somebody wants it for 1500. If you don't know what that drop is and that you're actually going below minimum wage, you're going to give your work away for less than minimum wage. 
I've seen people do it, where after they're done and they do the calculation, they're like, I made $6.34 an hour on this painting. And I ate the cost of the materials, right? I, I wasn't even built in by the time it was done. And it's like, well, why would you give your painting? Like, I, I understand you're happy to make a sale, but I, that wasn't a sale. You got robbed. Well, let me rephrase it. You robbed yourself. Like, you don't give your work away like that. Um, and, and the only way to make sure that doesn't happen is to have a reason for the price. To know that it was priced a certain way for a reason. That it was not an arbitrary number that generated the, uh, the, the price that you were charging for the, um, for the work. Because, right, you know, if, you're, if you ask $2,000 for a painting and somebody says $1,500 and you're only thinking about the fact that it's $1,500, well, $1,500 doesn't sound so bad. But if you know how the $2,000 was, was arrived at, the $1,500 might be a terrible, um, terrible situation for you. And, and, you know, it's funny. You do the painting and you sell it, you sell it at, at $1,500. That person's going to tell everyone they know about your work, which sounds great. The problem is that they're, they're also going to want your work at that price, <laughs> which means you just opened up a market for paintings at minimum wage, where you were originally thinking $12 an hour, right? Again, and so it's more than just making a single sale, but it's, it, it's always this way. The person you do, the person that you kind of, you give them everything, they're the one that sends you clients. Like somebody who pushes you around and has you, has you jumping through hoops during the painting. Can you fix that? Can you change that? Could you do this? Could you do... They're the one that sends their friends to you and their friends are just like them. And so you wind up buried under one problem after another because you did, because you were a little bit more flexible with somebody than you should have been. And these are lessons, like Daniel's learning that lesson right now. <laughs> yep. But these are lessons, you, you, you have to go through it and you, you learn them as you go. Where... You know, when you meet a client, if they're difficult at the beginning, chances are they're gonna be a thorn in your side the whole time you work. And then they'll send you friends who are gonna be a thorn in your side because they'll tell them what the process was like and how they were able to tell you how to fix these things and do that and do that. And so their friends come into it thinking that that's the process and they don't wanna miss out on it so they inject themselves into the process as well. Oh, and it was 12, it was 2000, they knocked it down to 1500, so they're gonna want that also. Right? And you start losing ground, you start losing your authority. And it's, it might sound like a ridiculous scenario, but it really does happen like that. You surrender your authority. It's hard enough, it's hard enough to maintain authority as an artist in this world anyway, because so few of the artists that are out there have any business acumen at all. And so um, anybody who's had experience doing business with an artist will immediately starts in a position mentally that um, you don't know anything. And it's always surprising to somebody if you're an artist and you, and you actually have a sense of things. Sadly, most artists don't. Most artists just want to be in their studio making paintings which is fine, um, but they get taken advantage of. You know, if you're an artist and you need an agent to be able to sell your work, right, because you can't sell your own work, the agent can bill you whatever they want. And there's nothing you can do because you won't feed yourself at all if the agent doesn't take that job. And again, people who buy things, they'll try to negotiate. And you'll negotiate if you don't know why your price is what it is. Or you might build into your price negotiating room, right? Because you could do that also. You, you could actually build in and say, look, you know what? It's a $3,000 painting, but I can go down as far as 2,200 if really pushed. 
you can do that as well. You don't want to make that that you don't want to make that your standard, um, because again, you know, like all of these places, it's it's a small world. Um, anybody who's been around for a while knows that, and and the word will get out that you basically that you elevate your prices. You know, it's like um, you know you sell. Um, well, you get this company here, My Pillow, and it's like a pillow is forty nine dollars. But if you buy now, we'll give you a second one free. Well, we all know the pillow is actually $25. And if you buy one for $49, you got taken. Right? And so you come into it knowing that you won't ever buy that pillow unless you're getting one free because you're being robbed in the process. And again, you're, you're going to build your career in a lot of ways through referral. That's, that's generally how it goes. You do good work. People show the work off, and even if they're not making the referral, it happens. And so you want to make sure that you're that you're not playing those games. That you set a price that's a good, fair price. You're making what you need, they're getting a painting, and they feel like they've gotten a good deal on it. Um, and so as long as you're doing that, and you know where the price came from, and you don't have to get into those games. You know, that's like used car salesman stuff. No offense if there are any used car salesmen watching. But at least at least you know the caricature of the used car salesman. Rod said, I have found if you undervalue your work, people will also. I sell more at a higher price because people perceive value. Cheap is cheap. Yeah, absolutely. You'll find um, the more you charge for your work, the nicer the clients become. You know, because what happens is you get clients who understand what they're buying and they understand that like they're hiring you because you're the one with the expertise. They don't inject themselves into the process so much. Um, not that they don't ever, but that it's less, it's, it's less likely. The less you charge for your work, the more headaches. It's like all jobs. You know, when you're, when you're a teenager and you're, you're getting your first job, your first couple of jobs, they're awful. The people that run the places are terrible to you. Um, you're underpaid for the work they make you do. You do all the dirty work. It's, and then as you start to get further down the road, along with your larger paycheck, you're also the work, speak, the work becomes less grueling in most cases. You're, you're treated better by your boss. Not always, but, but generally speaking, the lower, you, the lower your pay scale, the worse you get treated. Um, and generally it starts with, you know, as you, you know, as a teenager, um, and hopefully as you, as you get older and you're more educated in the job you move into, you're treated with more respect than you, than you would be as a teenager stepping into a, a baseline job, a, a starter position somewhere. But I think I've found that in most cases, the people who are treated worst at work are the ones who are paid the least, which is really awful. You would think if you're gonna be paid very little, they'd at least appreciate your being there um, and, you know, and treat you nicely, but it doesn't actually work out that way in most cases. Again, I mean, I'm speaking in general terms, obviously. There are some places that are, you know, like here, this is like the greatest place in the world to work. Right? Of course. <laughs> uh, Dan Lee just said, if you change the neighbor's car starter for free, you're a good guy. Charge them 150 bucks. You're the best mechanic in the neighborhood. Yeah, there you go. Well said. And again, like, you know, we, I talk about cost versus value. Very important. Yeah, there's a big difference. I talk about that with the mom, actually. Um, 
you know, the program. Actually, we talked about this a little bit when we talked about like old Holland paint, but like like with the old home, the, the um, with the evolved program, it might seem expensive until you realize what you're getting, right? So if you look at the number by itself, that is the cost. But if you look at what you get, the value of the program, I would, I'd like to argue, is worth a lot more than what you pay, right? So it's cost against value, um, like with the old Holland paint. It might look like a lot of money when you buy it, but the value of it is much greater than the, than the cost, where if you buy paint that costs less money, the value is not so great, right? So much so that it's cost effective at yeah. that point. Yeah, it's cost effective to get the better product. Like look, uh, like with Evolve, I would say, you know, you can go and you can fumble around in art programs for the rest of your life and never get what we could deliver to you in, in a year's time. Um, but you have to be willing to put to pay the, the cost in order to get the value. Right? And you know, part of it people it's funny that like, people think in terms of their value, like, you know, they, they think in terms of money first. But your time is your most valued commodity. Right? I mean, we've talked about this already, but your time is the most valuable thing you have because it's limited. Right? I mean, it's going to run out at some point, and there's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you do will get you one minute more than you're going to get. I mean, that's just how it is. And it's like that for everybody. Nobody, nobody gets to dodge that bullet. Right? And so the first thing, like for me, I'm always looking when I do something, not so much what it costs, but how much time. What is the time commitment? Is this something, is this someplace that I want to commit my time? Am I gonna get out of it, you know, for the time that I put in? Am I gonna get out of it something that's worthwhile? You know, with a lot of the programs that you'll find online. And again, I mean, I'm assuming that for the most part, at least that I'm speaking to people who are involved in at the school or in Evolve, um, most of the, problem, the, the programs that you'll find online, like on YouTube, uh, they're not even programs, they're just, they're how-to videos. You spend your time, but get very little out of them. And because there's no money attached to it, you feel like it's a deal. But the thing is your time you gave up. And even the, and if you got nothing out of it, nothing nothing meaningful, you just gave away hours of your life. Again, your most valued commodity, and you will never get them back. They're gone. They may as well have been money because they have value. And so, like you know, changing your thinking on that is that's it's very important. Like, if you don't value your time the way you value your money, you're, you're thinking about it wrong. You know, this, you, you hear the term a lot, time is money. The person who came up with that term didn't understand the value of time. comparing the value of time to the value of money. No sane person would make a comparison. Some, just some basic structural things in there, and I'm just gonna kind of speckle this thing.
I am going to go back in and later on, and I am going to bring some of these things up. The, I am going to be building in highlights. Those highlights will help to make these things feel a bit more solid. I don't know that I'm going to bring them up to the value of the photograph. In fact, I'm pretty sure that I'm not going to because I don't want this distracting from what's going on up here. This is going to be, it would be really dynamic if I made these values as, as uh, if I made them as rich as they are in the, uh, in the photo. Um, and that's part of the reason that I'm leaving so much of the canvas showing through. I, this is really nice and it falls away beautifully from a distance. It doesn't dis distract from what's up there. But if I make these too bright around all this dark down in here, it's not going to hold up very well. Pooja, one of our new students, yes. said, I have just started with the program, just watched the first block, and can say I learned so, so much. Kevin makes the painting block also very interesting, which I never thought I will find interesting. Hmm. All right. Thank you, and welcome to the program. Yeah. You know, it's funny, I don't know, like, the, the, the block one video is like the 13th iteration of that. Um, at this point, I don't even know what's in it anymore. I'm like, um, I don't, I don't feel like I'm like I'm entertaining or engaging. I'm just like, put the damn paint down. <laughs> <laughs> it really does feel like that. I walk, I walk out of the studio after we shoot, and I'm exhausted, in large part just because it's been done so many times. Um, as we've been trying to continually move the. Um, the education along and make it better, right? And you know, some of you are, are not aware of that, but these these videos, they've gone through so many changes, and it's the changes are a result of the students in the program showing us where where we've fallen short in explaining something in a clear manner, and so um, the program, to a degree, has grown in in. Um, and its ability to explain things because of the students. We see the places where students are absolutely killing stuff and we're not having any problems at all. And then we see places where students are not able to make sense of what's been put in front of them. And we know that those are the places that we need to kind of step up the language that we've used. And when I say we, I mean me. Um, Nicholas is wondering if there's a blooper reel. I think they're all blooper reels. Um, just because they're educational doesn't mean they're not blooper reels. I mean, consider, I've been, I've been standing up here talking, I mean, basically the times we've been here, nonstop for like 70 hours. I don't know that there are real blooper reels to even be had, to be honest. Um, I don't know. Um, have I done anything yet that, I, that would fall into blooper reel <laughs> while I'm working here? I don't think so. Nothing, nothing jumps out at me. It would be great if we had a bunch of that kind of stuff to publish it at some point. <laughs> to me, it almost like, um, you know, the movie Shrek, at the, I think it's Shrek. At the end of Shrek, they have uh, blooper reels and obviously they just created them because, you know, animated characters don't make mistakes. Mm -hmm. But anyway, it would be fun to maybe make a, a blooper reel around here with stuff. <laughs> That'd be fun. I've been watching um, The Office uh, while we're in quarantine. I've kind of gone through the show, The Office, 
if you haven't seen it, it's a really great show. Um, but it basically, for those of you who don't know what it is, it's um, it's a, a paper company in Scranton, Pennsylvania, and they have this thing. They're going to have a video crew come in and basically film them, and they're filming them all over the place. They they they. They follow them home. There's all kinds of stuff. So they're they're always on film. It's like a nine year thing of them being filmed, and it's just a just a, a, a ridiculous host of people. Um, the guy who runs the the guy who runs the office, um, I forget his name, Carell, Steve Carell, uh, very funny guy, but horribly inappropriate, um, but a really kind heart. He's just he's just dumb as a brick. And um, there's so many, so many uncomfortable things that happen in the show. But anyway, I could see us making a blooper reel like that around here. It would be hysterical. Um, that would be fun. We've actually talked about having people videotape me while I'm running classes. Um, hmm. That has been a conversation over the years. Um, I'm, I'm so much more on my game when I'm just doing my thing. Like here, um, you're getting a very natural view of me because I'm busy working. If I were just sitting here and I was being and I were, were being asked questions, it wouldn't be so easy. Like we do video, and um, like I've got a, I've got a video I've got to do soon for um, a webinar, and it's I'm writing the script out so I know what I'm talking about, and it's like I become so stiff the moment we turn the camera on. I'm not like this. And it's, I don't know how to, I don't know how to break that. Um, and so, like if we, we, we've talked about trying to capture, capture Kevin in his natural environment. <laughs> it's like a nature documentary. Um, so people can get a better sense of, of what it is that we do here, um, who I am. And then we did these live videos and everything kind of came together. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we've actually talked about in the next iteration of the, which we hope will be the last iteration of the educational videos, that we are, we're, we've been talking about actually having an audience so that I can do the, the, the educational aspects and people can ask questions and I can speak with them um, again, you know, possibly having a couple of people who have been through the program are finished, a couple of people who are in the program, and a couple of people who maybe um, haven't started yet, but are planning on starting. And so that we get a broad range of questions that I can answer pertaining to the, the exercises that I'm doing as I'm teaching them. And I think it, it would make a much more natural format it would be a lot more like what we're doing here, only the conversations would be particular to the exercise that I'm teaching. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Your friend Matt said, ooh, ooh, pick me. <laughs> it's a long way off. We have a lot of other things to do. Um, I, have, I have blocks nine through 12 I have to organize before we go back and do it. So there's, there's a lot to be done before we get there. I imagine it's probably more than a year away.
start to move along. Slowly but surely getting there. Again, the more as I do these, the, the faster they'll go. Uh, I am looking forward to getting the apron done in a big way. Making good time. Cindy said, my 79-year-old husband has been listening to what you've been saying and agrees with all your life lessons. Well, I appreciate that. So I'm making some adjustments to this. I can see what the pattern looks like. It's not so obvious here. And so I'm basically going to just turn this into the same thing as the rest of these. Um, it's not an overly complex design.
a question from earlier. Yes. Do you use the same medium for all of your layers? Yes. For the most part, yes. Um, I might change up the amount of alkyd um, or oil as I go based on what I'm working on. But overall, yeah, I'm, I'm using the same, the same linseed oil and alkyd just possibly in different percentages. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's the same. I wouldn't switch to a completely different medium while I'm doing this. Question from Cindy. Yes. Do you choose the music being played in the background? No, I don't. Um, Daniel, turn it on. Is it good? Is it okay? Because if it's bad, it's Daniel's fault. <laughs> if it's good, I, I approve it. It's good. The truth is, like, while I'm working, I, I really don't even hear it. Um, So I'm just basically just drawing these patterns and I, I'm using the photograph barely as reference at this point. I know what the pattern is and so I'm just, just addressing the overarching pattern and I'll deal with any, um, I'll deal with any darker or lighter things later on. I'll make adjustments to it later, but it, again, I don't need to paint this. I need to paint something that feels like it, right? We talked about that last week or the week before. It's not about the specifics. It's about how it feels. Like, I'm not, I'm not making something completely different. I'm capturing the overall feel of it rather than going for the particular visual um, specifics. And I, I can't stress it enough, I'm going to say it again, it's not a shortcut. Like what I'm doing now is definitely going to shorten the road because I'm not trying to replicate these. I'm trying to create a pattern that, that I can use over and over to describe this. Um, and so because of that, it becomes a bit of an assembly line, but I have to be careful about letting it get away from me. It doesn't take much. Right, and I'm allowing the brush to be a little bit, a little bit,
clumsier in here because this is really bright and it's really up front on this side. Like over here, I don't need it to be so, so bold, but up in here, it should have a little bit more going on. Also, down in here, these lines are so crisp and clean, but up in here, it doesn't feel, it, it's just like a cacophony of, of visual stimulation. All kinds of variations, and all these things going on. If I am too precise in here, I will lose that, um, that chaos. And so I wanna make sure that as I'm doing this, that I'm maintaining, again, it really does look like chaos. Again, remember, like we're looking at this right now because we're working on it, but in the grand scheme of the painting, it's just a decorative element. And that's all it's going to be when the painting is done. You're barely going to notice it as long as it's done right. This one's even becoming even more chaotic. Like each one of these little things has like four different, distinctly different values in it. And again, there is no way um, I'm building that in. It'll create it'll create too much of a focal point, and it'll start to feel rendered, forcing my hand to render other things. So I'm actually trying to work a little bit, a little bit quicker on this and let some of the control go. It's so easy to meticulously render every mark here, which again, I would say would make this feel more static, which is something I want to avoid. And so I'm, I'm moving through them and letting them be a little more organic. Um, not worrying about the lines being thicker or thinner, just trying to get everything in place. To describe what's going on in, in really what are arguably general terms.
right? And it's funny, like mark by mark, it might look um, unrefined and uh, sloppy is not the right word, but I think chaotic is probably the right word. It's, it looks a little bit, it's uneven. But when you step back and you look at it as a whole, it'll pull together. It's almost like, you know, if you look at, you look at one leaf, and then you look at what, if you stand outside of a, outside of a, um, a forest and you look at the trees for all of the leaves, the leaves are just a, just a, a mess of chaos kind of on the branches as the branches are just kind of swaying in the wind. You don't see the particular of a leaf, but for all of the shapes, right? Again, a leaf, you see it this way, but every leaf that you're looking at on the trees, there are all kinds of different angles and there's a bit of a chaos created by them. One leaf at a time may be being separated and that angle under that light might look funny, but all of the leaves together come together to create the impression of, of that forest, at least from the vantage point that you're viewing it. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm allowing some of that chaos to creep in here because it's what I feel when I look at this. back down to my very fine series seven number one to outline these things again these curves very hard to outline with a filbert but this round does a really nice job on it very precise Letting these things kind of open and open and close a little bit. I don't want to have. I don't want it to be so precise, like I like I did it up in here. The lines up in the in the coffin up in here are much more precise. I want them to be a little bit more organic down in here. And again, I want to be careful not to go too far. Easy enough to to let this kind of get out of control. Um, so I do want to make sure that I'm maintaining. Um, some, some sense of the linear nature of these marks.
Will the stick hold, help hold the hand steady? This? Yeah. Yes. Um, but where I'm working, I don't have a good angle. I, like out in the middle of the painting, this is great. But at this edge, my hand, I may as well be resting it on the canvas. I don't have enough lift here. It's kind of an uncomfortable position. So I'm, I'm, I use the mall stick out here more. Um, it's not as effective as I get closer to the edge like this. And I guess if I used it, if I had a small stick, like half the size, it might, it might be okay. But, and even though I'm not really using it, I have it in my hand. Like I haven't put it down since I started painting because I've been a couple of places where it was actually helpful. If I don't have it in my hand, I probably won't go looking for it. Just keeping it readily available. Question from Trina. Yes. The color you are applying now, would that be a mid-tone value of that gold color? Yeah, it's, um... Let's see if I can show it to you against something white. This is arguably white. It gives you an idea of how dark it is. You see it? Mm -hmm. So, it gives you an idea of how dark it is against white. And, um, So, like I would say, so this is actually white. So this is a little bit darker than white, and you get an idea of just how dark that is. Um, it's like a value four out of, you know, if white is one and black is 10, it's like a value four. It's really quite dark. Um, actually, if you could wipe that. It doesn't have to be perfect, just. Mm -hmm. In case I decide I need the photo later. Yeah. I mean, we talked about this very early on in the process, how I'm controlling the value range. I mean, this thing that I'm putting down, it's like a value for, reads as a highlight. It doesn't read as a, it doesn't read as a dark. It reads as a highlight against the other things that are here, which was the intention.
The intention is to keep the value scale as far away from white and black as I can while still getting the overall impression. of the value range, right? Because we exhaust the value range first when, when, we, when we paint, if we're not careful. We'll wind up with things that are in the painting that are white and then try to figure out how to build a highlight in on top of that. And then there's just no way to do it. And so we want to be very careful in the process to stay in the middle ground, stay in that light, five, six, seven value range for as long as we can. And we kind of only step out of it, step into fours as highlights and, and you know, eights as extremely dark things. And again, it's, it can be easier to say than it is to do. Um, It requires it requires a it requires that you be thoughtful about it the whole time that you're working. The approach that I'm using on this painting does make it a little bit easier. Um, it makes it easier because we start the painting starts in that value range, in that very middle ground value range. So we don't have anything very light and we don't have anything very dark. And then all we're doing while we're while we're building up the painting is continuing to continuing to work within the values that are down and then just nudging a little lighter from time to time nudging a little bit darker from time to time but those are all subtle steps they're very they're very delicate um, adjustments we don't have anything that jumps off the canvas as we work like even these white gloves are not white they're not even close um, if you look at them on the palette if you saw them on the palette you would know they're actually they're actually like a neutral gray And yet, in the painting, they read as white. They don't read as a gray in the painting because of how they relate to everything around them. And here, I'm just trying to create some of the patterning here. I'm not gonna get into anything too complex.
like you said, even though I sat here and watched, that left side looks like a darker shade of that yellow. Is it the same yellow um, yep. value that you used all day? Yep, it's exactly the same. Yeah, everything here, it's all the same.
question from Deborah. Yes. I heard children are much harder to paint. Is that true? No. <laughs> uh, we actually talked about this a few times, like this idea. Uh, if you know how to paint, children, adults, elderly, dogs, landscapes, still lifes, they're all the same. You know, a child's face is made up of values, meaning how dark or light an area is, colors, you know, meaning what color, and then the edges that connect them. A ball sitting on a table is made up of the same moving parts. So if you understand how the moving parts work, a portrait of a child, a child with a grandparent, two very different looks, and sitting on a rock with some trees behind them, the trees, the rock, the clothes, the child, and the grandparent are all just values, colors, and edges. And so they're actually equal. We tend to give more, um, we tend to elevate one thing over another. We'll be told hands are hard to paint, but hands are made up of colors, values, and edges. And if you understand how those things work, you're just painting values, colors, and edges doesn't matter that they're hands. When you start thinking of them as hands, they become difficult. A child's face is only as difficult as you make it if you understand how values, colors, and edges work. And again, so, you know, I keep, like I realized a lot of, some of the people that are here don't know that this is, um, they don't know about Evolve. We've not really been, it's not really plastered anywhere. Evolve is a program that, um, that we teach here at the school and that we teach online. Um, but if you're interested in a little bit of information about this, about how the program works, how to start thinking about things, we actually have put um, somewhere out there, um, we have videos, the first few videos from the program, which teach you at least the beginnings of how to think about value and edge. Um, so you can, Daniel, maybe you can get those posted. And you can check those out if you're not part of the program already. Um, and at least you can get a little bit of, a little bit of information about how we think um, about those things. And it really is as simple as I make it sound. Like once you understand how those things work, it doesn't make any difference what you paint. Because it's, it literally, everything is made up of values, colors, and edges. The Sistine Chapel, for all of its complexity, for all of its scale, is made up of just those three moving parts. A ball on a table with one light source, three light sources, doesn't matter, but it's the same thing as the Sistine Chapel. It's just that you might only have to apply those moving parts eight or 10 times on a ball and on sitting on a table and maybe 200 million times on the Sistine Chapel. But the idea is the same. If you understand the idea, a small painting or a big painting doesn't make any difference. A ball or a portrait doesn't make any difference. Teresa said, unless you are painting from real life, then the challenge is to keep the child still. That is, that is uh, obviously problematic. And, you know, obviously you're not going to paint a baby that way. You'd have to work either when the baby is sleeping or you'd have to work from photographs. But again, you know, realistic, realistic expectations. You're not going to get a three-year-old to sit still long enough to paint them, uh, unless they're asleep. And that's not a bad thing, but even that, there's no guarantee they're going to stay in the position you put them in. So you've got to work fast. But look, I mean, you, you know, one of the nice things is that we, we live in a world with photography. So as long as you can take a good photograph, you should be able to get reference that's good enough for you to create a beautiful painting, um, even with a child that doesn't sit still. So what fast shutter speed is for. Yeah, but still lifes are definitely, they're definitely easier to paint from life than people because they don't move. There is something to be said for that.
Just so you know, it is two o'clock. Yes, I'm gonna break it up in a few minutes. I just want to knock this thing out. I think. Actually, you know what? I think we will break it just as I finish this up. When I come back, I'll finish this, and then I'll jump in and I'll do the chains. And I think that will be our day. Yeah, I just want to step back and take a look and see how it feels. Again, I'm stepping back about 10 feet. I know the viewing distance on this thing is actually going to be quite a bit more than that. But if it pulls together nicely at 10 feet, it's doing everything it's supposed to do. Um, as you get closer, the details just become more prominent. Um, but yeah, I think I'm, I'm liking the way this is looking. There's still more to be done. It's not finished. There's more to be done. Um, in, in here, I'll be glazing some things in. So I think we're gonna break here. Um, uh, we'll break for 15 minutes. When we come back, I'll finish. I'll finish this band in here, which is very much like this. And then I'll go and I'll do the chains. And I wanna to touch up a couple of things in here. I wanna get a darker shade to connect. I'm not liking these feel too much like holes right now. So it's not exactly what I wanted it to look like. And I've been bouncing around what to do with it. I think I'm gonna connect it with another value. Um, so I'm gonna to try to get this thing knocked out and then get in here and clean this up. And if we have time, I'm gonna go back in and I'm going to rework some of this stuff and try to bring it up closer to a finish so that when I glaze it, I have less to do. There's not much else to really do. Like, I'm not gonna jump in. I thought originally that if I had forgotten about the chains and I thought, I can get this done and have maybe an hour left and kind of knock out the flag, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm not in a rush. I'm not in a rush. Um, this painting is going to spread out into next week, whether I like it or not at this point. So there's no point in trying to, trying to push through it and get it done. Uh, I'm just going to work. not bite off too much at any given time. Just Finding the right brush. And again, even this, this is a pretty clean edge. I'm gonna leave it a little bit more jagged. So you've got these little hits of highlights and darker things in here. And so they, they give the impression of a more tattered edge that is actually there. And so for the sake of the painting, I'm gonna do the same. And I've done that in other places here. Where I'm not really worried about the edge so much. Um, and so I'm just gonna carry that on into this next area.
So it'll be nice to have the apron basically out of the way um, at the end of today. We do have work we have to come back in and do on the apron, but all of the heavy lifting will be behind us. Um, depending on how quickly I get the chains done, because I, 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 I really don't know um, how the chains are gonna play out. Um, they could be pretty quick. They could take a while, but if I have, if I can get them done by say 3.30, I'll probably go in and start highlighting the apron. Again, everything that I can get done without stressing myself out or pushing too far, the better. Um, it gives me, it puts, it puts less on my plate for the next few days. Every little thing I can kind of chip away at at this point moves me closer to that finish line and again, I don't want to start anything that I can't finish. I, at this point, I'm looking for a, a low stress um, run across the finish line. They say I've got um, somebody I know, he does, um, he runs Ironmans. And he says like a lot of people, when they do them, they get that to the finish line and they, they push really hard. They, they dig deep and they, and they run as hard as they can to get to that finish line. Instead of just, you know, you, you just, you, know, you just swam two and a half miles and you, you biked for what, like 26 miles of 50, so I don't even know, it's some no, it's actually, no, it's like 100 miles or something. And then you're, and then you jog, well, you run for 26 miles. And so the finish line comes up and you like get every bit of energy and run across the finish line. He's like, you know, just savor it. <laughs> Take your time. Let the finish line crawl to you. Let it be calm and casual. Enjoy it. You know, because on the other side of that, there's throwing up and everything. <laughs> enjoy it. So here, I, like I, I just want to kind of enjoy the pace that I'm setting for myself now. So if I can pick off one thing here and one thing there and not have a whole laundry list of things that have to be resolved at the end, because I've been picking them off a little bit at a time as I've kind of worked my way to the finish line, it, it really kind of lightens the load for me and allows me to enjoy what's left. And that's really what I want. I want to enjoy, I mean, trust me, I'm sure you can tell, I've enjoyed every bit of this. But I want to make sure that I don't, I don't start pressuring myself or, or forcing myself into um, scenarios where I'm trying to get something done up against a four o'clock deadline so I can go home. Um, I don't want to put myself there. And I don't want this to stretch out into not just next week, but the week after. I need this thing done. Um, and so if I start just knocking off some of the things that are in between me and that signature at the end, there'll be less little things to have to deal with as I get closer to the end, and it'll really just be a pleasure to roll across the finish line. And that's what I want. I want to just kind of roll across the finish line at this point. I've done all of the work. And I also, one of the big things I want to do is I want to make sure I don't create any more work for myself than I need. I don't, I don't want to do anything now that's foolish and generates more work. This painting is just about done. It's so close to completion. The last thing I want to do is anything that's going to kind of put me back into a place where I've got to do any heavy lifting. Because there's, there's literally no heavy lifting left. Um, at this point, it really is just a stroll um, to finish. And that doesn't mean that the things that I'm going to add that are going to be straightforward and simple aren't gonna contribute in a big way to the painting, because they are. The things that I'm gonna add um, between now and next week when it's finished are going to dramatically alter the painting. Uh, particularly the face, the jacket, but even in the background, when I do a flag, that flag is going to become a very, very different thing than it is right now.
I'll tell you, I went back and I was, uh, I was looking a little bit at the video from when I first started. If you go back and you look at that, and you see how colorful the flag is when I first put it in, compared to where it is now relative to the things that are in, the flag looks so colorful when I first put it down. And because of everything else that's gone in and around it, it now doesn't look that colorful at all. But it's actually very colorful. And um, I'm gonna be able to I'm gonna be able to elevate that that color a little bit now that everything else is defined. I now know exactly where it where its color and you know the color and value range fits into the painting because everything else around it is done. Um, basically defined. Just, just creating the impression of these tassels. And again, I don't want them to be razor sharp. I just want to hint at them. I'm going to knock them down and push them into the background a little bit um, when, I, when I glaze. So I want to keep my edges nice and soft. Just want to describe them, nothing more. Don't, I don't want them tightly rendered. I just want people to recognize, if you look at them, you'll know what they are, but nothing more. And that you'll only notice them if you're standing around kind of scouring the painting for, you know, for the particulars of it after you've taken the painting in as a whole. Right, these tassels should not be drawing your attention away from the face or the collar. And I gotta be very careful in here because this is very light compared to some very dark areas around it. So I do have to be careful with that. And again, I'm not leaving anything out. I'm, just kind of hinting at these things. I'm not worried about matching the thickness on them. They're tassels, right? And shy of you standing with the photograph next to the subject, uh, next to the painting, you're never going to know. As long as they read as tassels, it's all they need to be.
put together into these chains. So I'm just going to leave it just like that. So I'm going to stay in the same value range. Um, I'm not not getting any lighter. I'm squaring a photograph to the uh, to this so that I'm not creating a new angle as I'm looking at these things coming down. I want them to kind of match up. So this is dry. So. And I'm just gonna start going in here and basically one link at a time. For impression. I'm, literally, I'm not going to paint every little link here. I am looking for the things that explain the links. So I'm going to lay in highlights, and then I'll lay in, when I glaze, I'll lay in the darker things, and that should pull it together for me. Gotta find landmarks. So I've got one out here. I've got each one of these little steel balls at the bottom. I've got one out here and I've gotta place it. And again, I'm not gonna deal in, I'm not gonna worry about the um, the darker shades right now. Like these are not gonna look like very much now, uh, but they will pull together. Um, they'll start to look like quite a bit more when I drop the darker shades in. I mean, I'm saying quite a bit more. They'll look finished when I drop the shadows in. Um, so I'm just laying in some lights right now, nothing more. I do need to make sense of all the lights though. Um, so one, two, three, four. See, I'm kind of working my way down one at a time, making sure that every single mark I put in line, aligns with the chain link that I'm trying to describe. And again, I'm not painting in every detail. I can see they're just dashes. I'm gonna work my way across one row at a time. So that row is now in. I'm now gonna to move to the next row. The chain on the other side is actually simpler because you can't see the links. The angle of it makes it so you can't see the links. So it's going to be a bit more, it's going to be easier to abstract, which is what I, again, that's going to make my life a lot easier. 
if I, if I can create an abstract impression, that's going to do a lot more. And again, this one, as long as this one is done well, it'll explain the other one. And again, I'm only telling half the story at this point. I'm only explaining the highlights. Very easy to tighten these things up and make them feel a lot more rigid when I drop shadows into them. But you've got to be methodical when you do this. Like, Every single link, I'm actually looking at each individual link as I'm working here. And I'm not, it's not that I'm putting every mark exactly as I see it, but I'm, I'm describing, again, just like I did out here, describing what's going on here. I have to be more specific here because these chains are very, they're very clean and crisp. I mean, they're metal. So, and it's a repetitive pattern. So I have to be careful not to get too, um, not to get too free and loose with the information that I have here. Um, I have to adhere to it to a greater degree. Otherwise, it's not gonna feel, it's not gonna feel right. And again, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for how it feels. You know, I, I feel the need to say this over and over, but I'm, for all of the um, artistic license that I take, I am adhering to what's here very carefully. Um, I'm not ignoring what's going on here so that I don't have to paint stuff. Like that's not what's happening. And I wanna make sure that I, I don't leave that impression. Anything that I choose to put in or leave out is based on what benefits the final painting. Yeah, it's nice. From a few feet back, it's already starting to feel good and solid. So I'm three, I'm on my fourth one. Kind of liking it, working from the bottom up. I, found, I find that it's actually a little bit easier. Um, it's easier to grab that bottom one and then build up from there. So I'll be doing that, I think, for the rest of the way. Again, I'm just going to get the these balls that are down at the bottom in place. Um, try to establish them.
I go and I do the shadows on these, it's basically going to be the same thing. I'm going to have to go in and literally go one to the next and figure out where the accents go to bring this thing to life, to give the impression of, of chains. to remember like when you're doing something like this I'm not painting chains no matter how well I paint them they'll never be chains all I can do is create an illusion and so when I'm working I don't want to try to, to I don't have to put everything in because they'll never be chains I can make this hyper realistic they're still not chains they're just paint and so if I can create an impression that, that looks and feels like chains, not so much the looking, but feels like chains, then it'll be successful whether the details are there or not. I get cramps in my hand. You see me like, I get cramps in my hand as I work on these little things. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not so fond of working with small brushes these days. Um, a necessary evil from time to time, but I do try to avoid it whenever possible. And again, when I put the shadows in on this, they will be going in as a glaze. So it'll be very thin, it'll be very easy to move the paint around to get the result that I want. everything. The opaque that I'm putting down right now is not going to be as, it's not, it doesn't need to be as precise because I know that I'm going to be making all of the major adjustments to this with my glaze. And so I have a little bit more latitude. Again, I'm just dropping in highlights. It's really all I'm doing. I'm trying to place the highlights Really not much more. Thank you. 
to go around and I'm going to very, very subtly soften some of these edges. Um, and again, this, this goes back to what I was saying all the way at the beginning. Like, don't, I, I can sharpen these when I put my glaze in. It doesn't have to be razor sharp right now. So I'm just, I'm not going crazy. Just a couple of little taps knocking down some of those sharper edges that are here. Um, it gives me a little bit more to play with um, when I come back around on it in the next pass. You know, and again, I can always drop in a highlight on top of this, sharpen an edge later on. So I don't need it to be that sharp to start. Cross, jump into this one. So we're actually making decent time on this. benefits as well as its drawbacks. The benefit is that if I get something wrong, as long as it's not wildly wrong, nobody will notice. The drawback is that I've got to be much, thought, much more thoughtful about how I'm abstracting um, each of these shapes. Again, no racing. I don't, I don't get to run through this. This is where 
like in a lot of cases, this is what separates the pros from the amateurs. An amateur will just start scrambling and dropping in any mark anywhere. Um, I am being probably more measured here than I was in the face because I'm trying to create an impression of something and I don't have a lot to work with here. Again, it's so easy to just say, well, like nobody's going to know the difference. The truth is everybody's going to know the difference when they look at it. It doesn't feel like, it doesn't feel like anything. Again, I'm not painting every detail. That's not necessary. But what I paint has to make sense. And I mean, I'm basically just painting in the highlights. I've got purple in here for the holes in the chains. I've got the base toned down, which is the overall color of the chain. I'm just laying in highlights right now. Uh, it's not refined, but it'll become refined. Um, it'll become refined when I drop in the glaze at the end. See here, we're starting to get into these. I mean, there's really nothing going on out here. It's just a bunch of dots now. So I'm going to try to get these dots in place in a way that makes sense. Trying to use some of the some of the landmarks that I have down as I kind of work my way up through this. So I just kind of lost my place. So I gotta come back here and kind of start over and figure out where I am. So what I'm finding easiest to do here is to get about halfway from the bottom up and then start at the top and meet it down at the, at the halfway mark. I'm just finding it's easier to make sense because there's really nothing going on here. Um, there's not enough here to grab a hold of um, to travel that much distance.
and very often, I've kind of been saying this all along, a little bit of something and a lot of nothing kind of pulls this stuff together. outer one actually has quite a bit in the way of distinct edges so that's nice I get these highlights I think I'm going to stop there with this. So it's it's three o'clock. I'm going to leave the chains just the way they are. And again, you can see like this. There's a lot more going on. It almost looks like hieroglyphics. And this is just a kind of scramble of things. But as I step back, like I said, I get about my viewing distance right now is about six feet, and it's doing what it's supposed to do. Um, I've got to go in, and I've got to. I'll have to build up some highlights in here probably. Same in here, but I've got to build up highlights everywhere. Um, so I think at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start actually working into the apron with the next value. And that'll allow me to flush the apron out a little bit more. And that'll, that'll get me one step closer to its finished state. Um, an hour should be more than enough time um, to do that. I just, like I said, I still have my paint from, from last week. I just left it here. I mixed enough last week. Um, I don't have a lot. Like when I break the paint open, there's not a lot of paint left, but there's enough considering how thinly I'm using it. So, so this value is... It's quite a bit lighter than the one I was just using, and it's going to go down thin. Um, and I'm just going to work my way across. Um, in fact, let me grab, leave it just the apron. So, so this is a smaller version of the apron, but. It'll give me it'll give me enough information for me to drop in highlights um, and kind of pull this thing together.
again, I'm not looking to paint everything. Just a few things to really kind of accent what's down. Create the impression of a little bit more dimension. These things having a little bit more of a roundness to them. And here. Again, this is going to give an impression of dimension. Just that little bit of relief. So if I painted all of these details wet on wet, this would have been very hard. But now I'm able to drop these in and they're almost effortless. I'm literally just drawing on top of this scribbled pattern for lack of a better way of describing it. It's not very much actually there, but it's now gonna feel detailed. One of the beautiful things about a layered approach. Is that you can divide, you can divide the work where it might take, let's say it takes a hundred units of labor to paint this directly wet into wet to get it to look like this, it might have taken me five units of work to get the underpinnings and another five units of work to now scribble in some details on top and I get the same basic result. And again, I'm, I'm not drawing the lines, I'm kind of dabbing as I go. And each of these little things adds a little bit more dimension. So when this dries, I'm going to be able to go back into it and glaze. Again, so right now I'm putting in the highlights. I'll be able to glaze in shadows. And um, that pulls together nicely. Yeah. <laughs> Love when that happens. And again, I do have to make, I do have to make sense of what I'm doing here. Um, they're not randomly placed marks.
And so again, this is not, this is tedious work, but it's going to have a, it's not going to take a lot of time if it's done right, but it is going to have a dramatic effect on the final painting. It'll make it look like it painted in every detail with such great care. Only we know better. Right, and what matters is that the impression is there. That we have the impression of details. It doesn't matter how we got them, just that we got them. Now, I could have done this at the beginning, and I was actually thinking about it. I was thinking about doing multiple shades. I mixed them and everything. And then I decided this would be easier. It was an in-the-moment decision as I was working that this would be easier uh, to get the result. I gotta tell you, I'm glad I went this route. I'm really liking the way this is looking, the way it's pulling together. And again, if I got here and I found that it wasn't doing what I wanted, then I'd basically go back to the drawing board and figure out how to resolve it to get it the way I want it to look. Um, it's not like I would do this and it doesn't work and okay, well I guess that's it. I would have to figure out how to resolve it in a different way from the new starting point. <clears throat> it just so happens that we're getting a nice result from this. I mean, again, I don't want to make it sound like it was a stab in the dark. I mean, I didn't go down this road accidentally. I had an idea of what I would do. And it, um, and it happened to work out. So I'm not repainting everything. I'm trying to just bring up the things that are lightest. And again, I'm going to glaze this down afterwards and darken some things again. But I want to establish some of the things that are lightest. Things that are really kind of jumping out. So, I, like, I'm using the photograph, but mostly I'm using, like, I'm using the photograph to figure out what should be lighter. But then I'm using what's in the painting to place the marks. So. The painting's not 
the, you know, the application, putting the marks down, I'm just basically working them over what's already here. So it's not, it's not a lot of work. Question. Yes. Will you be presenting the finished portrait to the client framed or unframed? Um, unframed. I don't, I don't frame, uh, I don't frame my work um, unless I'm, unless I'm asked to. Uh, but better for the client to do it always. This is going in a, this is going in a space that um, there are, there are 50, 50 other paintings and it's going to be framed like the others. So that's not, um, that's really outside of my range. I'm not, a, I'm not a framer. Better to bring it to a framer, someone who actually knows what they're doing, um, to kind of make the decisions with the client. And I've had, I've had clients that when I've delivered a painting, I've gone with them to a framer. Um, but again, like for me, I, I don't know that much about framing. I mean, I can tell you what I think looks nice, but everybody's got their own taste. Right, and so what I like is not necessarily going to be the best fit for the client. Um, happy to offer my opinion if it's if it's asked for, but normally I stay out of it if I can. Right, you know, it's almost like you uh, you have a conversation or a debate with somebody and you win the debate, and instead of shutting up after you've won, you keep talking. I finish the painting and I deliver a beautiful painting. The last thing I need to do is contaminate that with with having an opinion about a frame I know nothing about, right? Better to, better to stay out of it. Let the, framer, let the framer take care of that. I have another question here from Russ. Mm -hmm. So is this a third yeah. value on the braids, base, medium, and this highlight? Yes, it is. Yep, it's exactly what I'm doing now. I'm now I am now starting to just put in highlights, which is creating a much greater effect of three-dimensional relief. Another question? Yes. What type of brushes are you using for the details? I find some detail brushes do not hold up to the weight of paint when working details. Well, so first things first. The paint that I'm using is super thin. It's completely see-through. Um, it's, it's got enough medium in it that it's, I mean, it's almost like, um, I'm trying to think of like how, what kind of a density to compare it to. I, I, I can't really think of anything that you'd be able to compare it to, but it's, it's really thin and it's really see-through. And the only reason that it stands out on this is that it's, you know, it's, it's just enough to cover, but you're seeing some of this color showing through it. You don't realize it. Um, I could use just about any brush to do this because the paint is so thin. It may as well be um, watercolor. It's it's so thin, and so uh, the brush is not as important as the you know the the choice of paint density. I mean, there's so many other things that are going on. I could do this with a bristle brush. I could do this with a fan brush. I, I, this, this, there's no brush I couldn't pick up and do this with. If, it, if the scale of the brush was, was the right size. Obviously, I can't do the details with this, but I have small fan brushes here that I could do it with. Um, I could use a sable, a synthetic, or a bristle, a filbert, a round. I, there's so many options. Um, I'm choosing to do the details now with a filbert. It's a number two, um, and it's a synthetic. But again, it's like, I, I'm not, sorry, give me one second, I'm just trying to figure something out here. Okay. I'm, I don't, I generally don't think of my brushes as detail brushes and, I mean, the, the size of the brush, I mean, you could, you could argue makes them a detail brush or not. But, um, again, I'm just using whatever brush fits and whatever brush, and when I say fits, I mean the scale, but also in shape. Like I talked about the filbert. Filbert's the greatest catch-all brush you'll ever find. You could do, you could paint for the rest of your life and never have anything but filberts, and 
you would be just fine. You would have no problems. Uh, I would argue also that the filbert is not the perfect brush maybe for any one thing, but it is the best overall brush for, for everything. And so if you never move beyond a filbert, you would be fine. Um, Another question? Yes. If the paint were thickest, would it affect the translucency? Okay, so if the paint were thicker, one, um, yes, we wouldn't be able to see through it. And so that would definitely affect the way all of this looks. Um, we also, it would also be a struggle on the brush. The, the, this brush is a, um, because it's, it's, so, it's so short and there's such a small number of hairs, it, and it's, um, it's, it's not gonna be able to push around, at least in, in impression-wise, it's not gonna be able to push the paint around and give you clean, crisp edges, which is what I want right now. All the, the bulk work is in, and this really goes back to the question that was asked just prior. You know, the bulk work is in. At this point, I'm just, I'm just pulling some information out to kind of finalize. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of looking at this, trying to make sense of it. I'm just trying to kind of decorate what's left here, um, pull out a few things here and there, but they're nudges, a little to the left, a little to the right, just bump, 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 no, nothing major, right? I'm just kind of decorating the surface of this thing that's already in. And so I want to use very small amounts of paint. They're easier to control, if something goes down and I don't like it, it's easy enough to remove. Right, and so right now I'm, I'm, I'm really just looking for control. And a smaller brush with thinner paint is going to give that to me. Uh, plus I'm getting into these very tight spaces. I'm looking for landmarks, trying to figure out where these where these little triangles go from being solid to being broken up. I'm trying to be as, as close to the photograph as I can manage. Um, at least trying to pay attention. So that I've got darker and lighter areas that explain the three-dimensional form. Another question from Russ. Do you refrigerate your creme brulees after you have caramelized the sugar? No. Nope. That's a funny question. Um, no. I, um, the, the creme brulee, once it's out of the fridge, um, so you, you chill it after it's baked, and then um, you, uh, once it's chilled, you take it out and you let it, you let it, you not let it come to room temperature, but you kind of let it sort of moving in that direction, and you, you brulee it and serve it, just like that. Um, you don't want the sugar being refrigerated after it's been uh, bruleed. I can't believe we're having a conversation about that. That's pretty funny. <laughs> I think you had mentioned it earlier. You talked about how you like to make creme brulee. Yeah, I imagine, I imagine that I did, otherwise, that would be a really kind of out there question. Yeah, for those of you who are just jumping, I cook. So. Wonderful. Just 
starting to take on another dimension. Like I said, I've, I've not painted this before, so I really don't know. I, like, I didn't know for sure that what I wanted to do would work. I, I, I took a risk with it, and in this case, it really paid off because I can't imagine how much work this would be if I tried to render this. Wow. Not just, if, if, it would be one thing if I was rendering it to be razor sharp, but to render it slightly out of focus is a nightmare. It's so much work. Again, every edge has to be broken down. So here, the value is very close. I can leave these sharp edges in. Um, I don't have to worry about them, which is very nice. I don't have to worry about them at all. They're so close to the value of the apron. And contrary to how bright they look on the palette, they're not very bright. going on on this side.
So I guess, like at the moment, I'm not even really looking at the photograph. I'm, I'm just dropping in some highlights into this gold that I put down because I know that the test is kind of raw out. And so I know at the very top, like the places where I drop gold down, I'm just kind of working into them to make them look more um, reflective, like sparkly. think too much about it. I'm just kind of working into what's already here. The bolder, the bolder marks that I have will get a little bit more of this light. The ones that are more subtle will get less. Um, I'm just kind of following the pattern of what I did when I started. All right? and if I did the job right at the beginning, um, what I'm doing on top of this will just reinforce my original decisions make them a little bit more dramatic. Make the tassels feel more metallic. Give them a little bit more character that won't be so one note, right? And not that they look bad as kind of one note marks, but if you can do more with them, it's gonna bring them to life. These little variations that it's a little bit lighter and then it kind of fades into a darker shade, just makes it feel more um, natural. We just don't see things in the flat, right? It's just not how, like everything has, everything has variation in it. So yeah, just being a little bit more careful up in here, because I did drop this stuff down. I didn't want it to be as strong. So that's pretty good. And again, down in here, I'm going to leave this, like this was lighter. But this is all fairly dark, so I'm going to leave that alone. Um, and we're doing good on time, actually. Um, it's actually moving along nicely. There's not a lot. There's not a lot over here to be done. Just a few marks, really not much. But every one of these marks adds a little bit more dimension. And so I don't I don't want to forego them. Even though it's really not much going on back in here, I do want to make sure I get them in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna work in, I think, some of this. I may have to let this go and, um, and do it next time, um, just because this stuff is still wet. And I don't know if I'll be able to overlay it the way I want. It, it seems like it's kind of fighting here. I don't wanna make a mess of it. So this stuff in here might have to wait. It's like a 
probably do this other stuff tomorrow. Should be dry. So I'm going to wind up leaving all that stuff. I'm just going to work on the things that are already dry. Question, will you take the painting to the client in person? Yes. Yes, I always deliver my paintings in person. I think that's very important. And are you going to paint the items, the metals, on the table today? Uh, no. <laughs> Not today. Not today. Uh, I'll be finishing in about 20 minutes, maybe less. I'm only going to do the rest of this, and then I'm going to leave this for tomorrow um, or um, Wednesday. So I'd like to get the metals on the table done this week. I don't, I definitely don't want them spilling over into next week waiting to be done. So, so the plan is to do them this week. And it's possible that I'll do them tomorrow and then I will come back on Wednesday and finish the apron.
then again I say finish I'm just talking about getting the highlights in the apron's far from finished as far as its look there's still quite a bit to be done to it it's mostly big brush glazing it's not going to be there's a little detail work but not much most of it is not is not going to be detail work I'm still, even as I'm doing this and we, you know, kind of talking about this stuff like details, it's still not details. There's, there's still just basic shapes that are being laid in. Trying to give an impression without rendering the particulars.
Just a sign. I want these a little bit more. A little bit more elevated. Probably the same with the sun. I want them to fall more in line with everything else that's here. And then I'll be able to knock everything else. I'll be able to knock it all back together as one thing. If it's too dark compared to the other stuff, I'm going to have to make adjustments for it in the glaze. So it's easier to just deal with it here.
we get like each of these little marks. If I cover everything, it doesn't have the same impact, but if I'm just accenting what's here, it starts to create a really nice three-dimensional impression. And so I'm selective about what I'm covering and what I'm not. And even this, when I put these down, it doesn't go everywhere. Some things I cover, some things I don't, some I'm doing on a slightly different angle, leaving some of what's underneath exposed so that I'm getting those variations. And I'm making the marks a little bit more organic, like what I did out here, because I've got all of this really tightly wound stuff already addressed. Don't need to be, I, I don't need to be so methodical at this point. All of this stuff is supported very well by, by what are pretty clean details. So I have a little bit of latitude to play here. Right, and this is just because I've done my work already. I couldn't do this if, if I didn't have clean underpinnings. All right, some of this, I'm, I'm literally just dusting over it. It's looking good. All I've got left is this, and that's going to be it for the day. We'll pick the rest of this up, if I can, tomorrow. If not, then we'll do it on, on Wednesday. We'll just see how it is. Um, Russ is suggesting that once a week we do a live stream featuring your students. Featuring my students? Mm hmm And everyone is saying that they would never get anything done. Are you bored with me? <laughs> you want my students now? Which students? The ones here at the school or the ones in the Evolve program? So I like to think that I bring a particular charm to this, that just about anybody else, after like 70 hours, you'd be bored out of your mind, but that you'd come for the, uh, you'd come for me, my personality, not the painting at this point. I mean, it's all the same thing over and over at this point. Yeah, it really is. So I have to assume you're coming to, to visit with me. Russ said, of course, moderated by Kevin. Oh, the okay. Evolve program would be great. You know, that's something maybe we can do at some point. You know, it's hard logistically because Evolve people aren't here. Um, and it wouldn't be educational, right? It couldn't be. I, I, I can't have my students necessarily um, teaching my program. So. Laurel said, never get bored watching you paint, Kevin. Well, thank you. And Sana said, we're here for the tangents. Uh, not many tangents today, though. No. You know what it is? It's a lack of questions. I think everybody's sleeping. I think everybody fell asleep on me. Today would have been a perfect day for questions. It's kind of mind-numbing work. <laughs> Missed opportunities. That's what that is. I should have said something early on. Just throw those questions at me today.
Sana said, nah, not sleeping. We're in awe of the detail. Which, speaking of which, we should do a, a close-up at some point. Well, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done. We can do a close-up after we finish. And we're just about three minutes out from being done with all of this detail work. And then you can get a close up and see that it's not as impressive as it might look from where you are. That's it for the details. Let me just, oh, this one. Uh, thought I was done. Damn. Carol said, it looks like you're sewing the stitches in. Um, what? Sewing the stitches in. Mm. Just about. Say, so yeah, again, I think I said this the other day, but you get a real appreciation for this kind of work, the real thing, the embroidery and all that, when you try to paint it. You realize just how precise and how particular it is.
completely forgot. I gotta get that in. I'm not. I'm not leaving that. Um, you see the like, cuff? No, I got it. There's not a lot here. This one. This should go pretty, pretty quickly. You also have that pin on the suit? Uh, yeah, I'll deal with that when I deal with the rest of this. And I think actually, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna stop. I'll deal with this, this, the pin, and this maybe tomorrow. Hmm. I'm done. I mean, at this point, it's not, I don't need to like, at this point, I know I don't need to push myself um, I don't have to put in more time. Like, I, I'm now, like I said, I'm coasting at this point, which is how it should be. Um, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be stressing myself out to get all these different things done. They don't need to be done right now. They'll get done, like I said, I could probably do them tomorrow, finalize all of this goal for tomorrow. Um, and then it gets done, it gets done in really in a stress-free way. If I try to cram it in today, I'm going to feel like I'm having to rush to get it done. And it'll show. It'll show in the, it'll show in the final work. Since, since I'm not going to finish, I've got other things I've got to do. Like, I've got to do this tomorrow. I have no choice. I can't do it today. So, easy enough to just, to just leave it. So I'm going to stop it there. If you want to go up close and take a look at that. Yeah, so it looks like tomorrow, Tuesday, we will finish off the apron, the cuff, maybe the medals around the neck and the lapel pin. And then on Wednesday, we'll do the medals that are on the table. And so then next week, it'll be the book. I'll do the, the background first, glaze in the background, pull out the flag, 
probably polish off the book. Actually, when I do the background, I'll do a little bit of work on his face, giving it one day to dry um, while I finish off the book, kind of glazing the metals and glazing the apron and all the other stuff that needs to be glazed, knock out the jacket. And then it'll be just be kind of polishing off the face probably on Wednesday of next week. And so the painting will be done next Wednesday, no doubt about it. Even if I have to do slightly extended days, um, there are certain things I want to get done and um, I'll make sure that at the end of each day that they are done so that Wednesday I'm signing the painting. So I can take a couple of questions. If, any, if anyone has questions, I'm happy to take them now. Sarah said it looks incredible. The sun looks like satin. Amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I wasn't really sure how the sun was going to come out. It kind of looked when I, it was before I put the lights in the other day. I was, I was concerned that I was going to have to go in and actually render it. And so it really pulled together beautifully. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a gradient in there too, which is nice. Sana said, those in the embroidery looks suspiciously like lines. Looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suspiciously like lines. Here's a question. Yes. What size is this portrait? This portrait is 35 inches by 53 inches. So I've done this a few times, but I'll kind of pull this down if you want to just get a sense of it. So I'm 5'8". It gives you an idea of the scale of the painting. All right. Those are the questions. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I will see you tomorrow at noon. Have a great day. See you tomorrow.